PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Welcome to PAC TV Community News, your local news source for the South Shore. This week we take you to a climate lab in Manomet and a new cafe near the Grove in Plymouth. We also meet an inspiring store owner in Pembroke, and our arts and entertainment segment brings the Spires Open Mic winner to the set to perform. Also this week we check out this year's Duxbury Idol competition and stop into a fundraiser with an artistic twist. It's going to be a great show, and we begin with a Kingston Duxbury connection. The Kingston Conservation Commission teamed up with the Duxbury Beach Reservation for an exciting new community project at the Cranberry Watershed Preserve behind the Silver Lake High School. The collaboration is for a beach grass nursery that will provide significant benefits to the residents of Kingston and Duxbury. PCN stopped into their volunteer workday to learn more. Yeah, this project is actually uh, the result of a grant uh, from the Coastal Zone Management, Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management Group, and it's a great regional project between the town of Kingston and the Duxbury Beach Reservation. And what brought this whole project together is that in a Duxbury Beach, uh, which is a four and a half mile long uh, coastal barrier beach, it's basically a, a glorified sand dune, um, and that beach, uh, basically our main erosion control measures is gr grass planting. And every year we plant anywhere from 20 to 50,000 culms in the little stalks of grass on that beach. And every year it also gets uh, eroded away with storms in different sections. So we constantly have a beach grass planting problem. But after these spate of hurricanes up and down the northeast coast, um, the supply of grass is actually getting pretty short. And so uh, what, the reason we went after this grant was to try and get a, a source of grass that's close by. So what we're doing here in the Kingston conservation land, where we're planting about 5,000 columns of grass, uh, with the idea that, um, that these columns re are remarkable in terms of multiplication. So if we put in you know, two columns in a little hole, then by next year, there could be 15 times that, and they just spread. So the idea is we'll harvest some of those, and then we have our own local batch of grass that's a source uh, for planting. Uh, we will actually buy it from the Kingston Conservation Commission at market value. Uh, so it, it helps the Conservation Commission, and uh, it's a great learning tool. Um, as you've seen here, we have lots of young people uh, working on the project, and, and it's a great way to help educate people about, you know, the importance of, you know, e ecology and, and erosion protection. Uh, we, we introduce the concepts of uh, climate change and rising sea levels, because anybody with the Barrier Beach is battling this today. So. Very interesting project. The town of Kingston is protected by two barrier beaches, Duxbury Beach and Plymouth Long Beach. So by providing the beach grass to the Duxbury Beach Reservation, we are helping them to protect their barrier beach and uh, also the town of Kingston from coastal storms. And the other reason why the Kingston Conservation Commission and the town of Kingston were interested in doing this beach grass nursery is that the proceeds will enable us to better fund conservation land management, not only of the Cranberry Watershed Preserve, but our other conservation lands. We have approximately 1,200 acres of permanently protected conservation land in Kingston that the Conservation Commission manages, but we don't get a lot of funding from the town through the general budget to maintain and manage that land. So this is a mutually beneficial project for Duxbury Beach Reservation, the town of Duxbury, and the town of Kingston. 
and it's just been a great collaboration with Duxbury Beach Reservation and the town of Duxbury, which we're always happy to, um, to work with. So it's a great benefit for both towns. Life has a way of overwhelming us at times. We have kids, jobs, relationships, home, health, finances, so many things to juggle all the time. One local woman who was feeling at wit's end ran into a nurse who looked at her and said, just breathe. So she began to do her journey. PCN met up with this creative spirit to see how life's battles lead her on a path of healing for herself and those around her. In 2012, Suzanne Ferreri Early started out on a business venture. That wasn't so much a quest for profit, but an inner calling to artistically express and heal. Her inspiration came from her daughter, who had spent much of her childhood battling illness. On one of their many trips to the hospital, a caring nurse looked at Suzanne and said, just breathe. And that's when Suzanne's life changed. This is what I would like to be doing. This is one of my dreams about Just Breathe, is to spread to other women um, that they can do things other than worry and worry and worry and like so these art classes are somewhat of an art wellness class where they're doing the art and they lose themselves in the moment and they're actually just breathing. Suzanne's art not only freed her but she knew that creating was truly a way of healing. A way of healing that she knew she could spread to others in need. Starting with herself. Molly was sick and cancer and I had to do that by myself. Then her friends, then to other mothers, daughters, and people who were hurting from life's burdens. And what I did this year is I had some friends who were artists who were selling out of their houses or shows like really small and they're fabulous and they're single parents and I thought you know what why don't you come aboard with me and you can use me as a vehicle to get out there and we've done that with three of the girls and they're doing really really well now like their lives are changing. The class PCN stopped into wasn't just your typical paint night. Not only was it a class of artistic expression and healing, but also a fundraiser for another family in need. So tonight we are doing um, a mixed media mantra motivational piece. So they're all going to have a notebook. And what a mantra is, is a saying um, like, I can do it. So they're going to put the words, I can do it, and then build around it with different art mediums. Um, and then so ha they'll, have a, they'll go home with a journal that they created that will make them feel stronger. Sometimes all it takes is a moment to realize one's true purpose. For Suzanne, who was once a wrecked with stress mother of an ailing child, was told to just breathe one day. An intern found her strength and purpose that she now shares with the community. No, it's just, you know, when you don't have things planned, and you just keep doing what's in front of you. Um, yeah, the universe just had a bigger plan for Just Breathe Art, and I'm going with it. Reporting from Bryantville and Pembroke, I'm Maureen Bates, PAC TV Community News. Yeah, Julie, this is sort of a, a form of recovery, in a sense, from the stresses and strains of life. Yeah, and a new way, a new way to look at it. We see a lot of yoga and a lot of mm -hmm. even paint nights, but this seems to to take a lot of different things and combine them together. Mm -hmm. And she's right. I mean, everybody should once a day just take in a deep breath. More than once a day. More than once a day. That's right. <laughs> For years now, Duxbury Idol has been a great way to showcase the musical talent in the Duxbury school system. It's also a great way to bring the community of all ages together. This year, the voting on the competition was a little different, but the talent level was just as impressive as ever. Folks arrived early to get tickets to what might be the town's biggest music event of the year, the Duxbury Idol. But this year would be a little different than in years past, so they called it a remix. The structure of the competition may be different this year, but there was just as much talent, if not more, than there's ever been. And while the show is for only one night, organizing it takes months. My focus tends to be on the ticketing part of it. So we do a lot of advanced ticket sales. There are families from all over town, not only the families of the performers who want to come in and buy tickets, but also families who do parties and they sit down front and the kids bring signs and they root for different performers and it makes it more of a really enjoyable experience for them. 
An event this size really brings the whole community together. It also requires a lot of helping hands, the helping hands of volunteers. That's where the expertise of event chair Sue Lawrence comes in. My role was to pull all the pieces together. And there are many, many pieces to this evening. I uh, pretty much round up a bunch of volunteers, which is always easy to do for this event, always. It is so much fun. So I, we coordinate who's coming and what jobs they're gonna do. And we have a lot of vote counts. So we'll have vote collectors, vote volunteers, because we manually collect the votes and then manually count them. And there's the faculty part of it, which is huge. They do so much to donate their time and uh, to get they're here tonight on a Saturday night um, as teachers. I just that you can't get any better than that. While Sue Lawrence organizes the volunteers, Hannah Rivetto and her group organize the event itself, a process that starts over the winter. It takes the entire music promoter group. We start meeting, we meet with the faculty. There are two faculty members, Joe Pendaco and Bob Judge, who are integrally involved in all of this, from auditioning the kids to running the show tonight to running the tech. The Music Promoters is a collection of families and community members whose children have long since graduated but continue to support the programs by raising money, not just for events like Duxbury Idol, but many of the little things along the way. For example, buses when they do performances in Boston so parents don't have to pay for the buses. If families uh, can't afford the cost of the instruments because everybody has to rent an instrument or buy an instrument, uh, we help subsidize that. At the end of the year, depending on what's left over, we fund scholarships not just for the seniors but also for any student who wants to apply for a scholarship for to do band camps or you know pursue anything else. So we try to defray costs here and there for the parents. Meanwhile, all 18 kids that auditioned ended up in the night's competition. And in years past, they would have faced a panel of judges. But this time around, it was audience members that did the voting, something to take a little of the stress out of the night. Duxbury Idol is really all about letting kids who want to sing, whether or not they're in the music program, do things that aren't um, related to the curriculum. So the choral curriculum can be very traditional and um, conservative. And this is a chance to let anybody who wants to sing get up there and do their thing. The takeaway on all of this, in a nutshell, is that the kids have fun who love to sing and perform on stage. In Duxbury, I'm Brian Sullivan, PAC TV Community News. Could be farther than I've ever Kingston's Edible South Shore and South Coast have teamed up with local pottery in Norwell to host an Empty Bowls fundraiser and spring celebration, all supporting the Greater Plymouth Food Warehouse. There were many incredible works of art created, and PCN stopped in to see more. If foliage to it, it's gonna be a little... So today we're doing a fundraiser. Um, it's a collaboration between local pottery and the Edible South Shore and South Coast magazine and um, we're raising money for the Plymouth Food Coalition. Uh, so you can come along and uh, pay $30 or $20, do one pot or two, and we're decorating our own pots. Uh, Lisa will then glaze them for us and we can pick them up in two weeks and those that aren't picked up will be sold. We've uh, invited a bunch of people to come and uh, make some pottery today. So it's a wet studio, they can actually come in and work with the clay. And we're doing it as a fundraiser for the uh, food warehouse of Greater Plymouth. So people get to come in, they pay $20 for one bowl or $30 for two, decorate it in any way that they like. We'll fire it for them, then glaze it, then fire it a second time and return it to them all finished. And all of that money is going to go on to the food warehouse. I've been a potter my whole adult life. I opened my first shop in 1996 and I just moved to this location last October. Um, so I've been making stoner pots all of that time and I carry work in this studio in the gallery downstairs from over 40 different artisans. So none of it is production made, all of it's made by individual craftspeople. It's a really wide range of different decorating styles and techniques. It's a pretty wonderful craft. I love it. So local pottery has been in business on the South Shore for I think around 20 years, 20 plus years. Uh, Lisa is uh, one of the uh, featured artists. She runs it, it's her pottery store. Um, and 
for me personally, it's just such a great way to um, pay homage, I guess, to a meal prepared at home. Um, when you're using real ingredients from local farms and you talk about the slow food process and things from farm to table, kind of putting it in something that is handmade and fired, um, for me, completes the process. It's, um, I don't know, I guess a way to honor the food or honor the meal um, that you're sharing with friends and family. The Edible South Shore and South Coast magazine is a wonderful publication uh, uh, published by two very passionate people um, and the idea is to bring a focus to all things edible and local here in the South Shore. I've been a reader for a long time and now I'm an advertiser with them. It's really my core group of that, you know, we share the same sort of customer base. They're people who care about local stuff and food and pots and craft, creativity. Um, those are my people, so they've done a great job with their magazine. They have wonderful content and I'm proud to advertise with them. So we're launching their spring edition here today as well, along with the Empty Bowls project that we're doing. The Greater Plymouth Food Warehouse is, uh, they're a wonderful group. They actually are a giant food warehouse and they supply, I believe it's 39 different food pantries in the region. So they're the uh, recipient of all the money from today's proceeds, um, just because they supply so many of the different um, food banks. You know, I thought it would be easy. Pottery is way harder than it looks. And so it was a fun experience. It was great to get my hands dirty and get involved. And I'm very excited to pick up my pots in two weeks. You know, again, you combine uh, a lot of talented people that are doing something that is an art and a passion with the whole local grown, the whole eating healthy. It's, it's a trend that is taking over the whole country, and I'm so glad that it's here in our neck of the woods. And nice-looking pottery. Beautiful. Yeah, I like Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes, it's gorgeous. As the local business community continues to grow here in Plymouth, we at PCN like to showcase some of the entrepreneurs that chose our towns to get their businesses off the ground. We recently met up with a young lady who took a chance on opening up an upscale coffee shop just off of Long Pond Road. Deep inside the office park on Camelot Drive in Plymouth, where the sound of 18-wheelers and industrial-strength garbage trucks driving by is the norm, you'll find the unlikeliest of coffee shops. In this area, one might expect to find a diner-type setting. You know, a greasy spoon with someone named Alice serving up short stacks and Joe, and a guy named Mel in the back shouting out orders. But not here. That's what this place used to be. But new owner Amanda Roy decided to move things in a different direction when she took over this location only a half a year ago. The Board of Health actually kept telling me to come here and check out this space. Um, it was Fat Mike's Diner before and he was retiring. And I had a coffee shop in the lobby of the Registry of Motor Vehicles in Plymouth for a little over four years and I was looking for a new spot. And the Board of Health kept pushing me into this spot and I couldn't wrap my head around changing it to make it mine. And I am so thrilled that I did. Do you have a coffee card? Yeah, perfect. The Jolly Bean is one of four operations in the office park that was able to get off the ground thanks in large part to small business loans from the town of Plymouth. In fact, if it weren't for those loans and the confidence and encouragement Ms. Roy got from the town, she probably wouldn't be here. The uh, town of Plymouth is the best town to work with. I have friends that work in other towns, have restaurants in other towns. This town is community supported. They will do whatever they can to get you up and running to back you. The town workers come here and they eat. We've created a home for them. We've created a home for ourselves within this park. The cafe has brought in a whole different menu and with places close by like the DPW, the police station, the prison, the sanitation department. No. Names not usually synonymous with things like lattes and gourmet muffins. Amanda Roy had a slightly uphill battle ahead of her. This is a restaurant for 30 years. The last owner was here for 12. I am serving a completely different menu than he was. He had a great following, so when people come in looking for him, they almost skeptical about trying mine, and when they do, they're good. We stopped in during what was supposed to be a slow time, and we still had to break up this interview so Amanda could tend to customers. An encouraging sign for this upstart. I started this with me working primarily on the schedule. I have expanded so much that I need to hire from my position to put myself into another role. This is growing and that's a, not a bad problem to have. At the Jolly Bean Cafe in Plymouth, I'm Brian Sullivan, PAC TV Community News. 
Climate change is a topic that gets a lot of attention in today's environmental circles. Many scientists have been studying climate change in varying ways all around the world. PCN caught up with a climate lab right here in South Plymouth that brings youth, birds, and climate all together. We're here today at Manomet Inc. and we have an eighth grade class from the Sandwich STEM Academy here. And what we are doing is connecting kids to nature. On this lovely day, kids are gonna learn a connection between bird migration and climate change. The three things we wanted to do are to measure the length and breadth of leaves and record that on a transect. So we wanted to show um, the three parameters that we're, we're measuring with vegetation. The exciting thing I think about this whole project is that it's keyed into climate change. Um, we have data here since 1966, so we're now in our 49th year of collecting data on the timing of the migration of birds through in spring. Each one of these red dots on here represents a bird that we banded here at Manomet that was found somewhere else. So this bird is a species of warbler called a Blackburnian warbler. This is a male common yellowthroat. And these guys are a species that we've actually noticed their timing is different over the years. The students have been working at their schools and they have been looking at the timing of leaf out, which is temperature dependent. They've been looking at, as the leaves come out, little caterpillars coming into the leaves, that's temperature dependent. And the migrant birds are returning, some from the southern part of the US, some from Central America. So they're all coming back and their goal is to hit that absolute peak of insects, fatten up, use that as fuel and continue their migration. It's going to go really fast. Are you ready? <laughs> they taught us about how uh, the migrations are different every year and how they track it. They use a lot of data and they um, keep the nets there over time. They said how uh, if the data was different, it showed there was a climate change. So if the climate was a bit warmer, they might change uh, their migration route. Well, the idea is we're collecting data over time at your guys' school and you'll go out in the next few weeks and collect data yourselves. And the idea is for you guys to build your own long-term data set. We formed a partnership with a great nonprofit called Turk, and they are curriculum development experts. And the program was being formalized from an informal program here at Manomet to a curriculum that could be applied in the middle schools. So we're specifically working with seventh and eighth grade. Our approach is to focus very much on the processes and the practices by which knowledge is created uh, and how the students make their knowledge for themselves. So the partnership between Turk and Menemet um, on the Climate Lab was, was uh, natural from that point of view. They have these materials that you might not be able to just get in your backyard. They put a lot of hard work into making these materials just for us. And so we were glad to have an opportunity to partner with this research institution to develop curriculum and evaluate the program and understand the dynamics that happen when schools and students and scientists work together to learn about the world and about climate change specifically. It's definitely an experience that you're probably not going to have another chance to get. As these birds, you actually, they let you touch them. I was able to actually let one fly away off my hand. When people encounter climate change in the press or even in curriculum in schools, it tends to be a it tends to come across as something that's distant, it's abstract, it's impersonal, and it's in the future. And with projects like the Climate Lab, we can help people see that it's here and it's now and it's affecting things that they care about and that they're familiar with. To close the show this week, we bring you a studio performance from the Spires Open Mic winner. Our arts and entertainment reporter will make the introductions. Take it away, Maureen. Thanks so much, Julie. Tonight we have on set Carlin Tripp, the winner of the Spire Open Mic Challenge from this past winter and spring. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Carlin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're from New Bedford. I am from New Bedford, yes. So how did you hear about this competition all the way up here in Plymouth? <laughs> um, well, I actually heard about this competition through uh, my friend Jake, who hosted it. Um, he let me know that he was going to be hosting an open mic challenge at the Spire. Um, and the Spire is just a venue that I've known about for a while, and I've always wanted to play there. I've seen shows there. Um, and it just seemed like a great opportunity to 
get in the doors and play a couple songs, you great, know? Great. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the experience and the different kinds of musicians you <laughs> encountered at this competition. Yeah, well, um, I've been playing open mics for a long time. I mean, I think as a singer-songwriter, that's that was the always the best place to start. Um, and so, you know, to come to, to this open mic, which was kind of a bigger deal, uh, I've never really done like an open mic challenge before. Um, it was definitely, you know, nerve wracking and, you know, the talent was there. This is like a very talented at neck of the woods. Um, there's a lot of people out here playing music and just doing a really good job. So, you know, I was nervous and I, you know, I wanted to have a good time and I just kind of got up there and, and played, you know, how I've been playing and I'm glad that everybody really liked it, yeah, <laughs> but, great. but the talent was great. I mean, especially at the finals, you know, they had, I think 12 performers and everybody was just on a great caliber. Um, you Wonderful. know, yeah. So you have won a yes. recording package with the C sound, which is out, you know, out of the spire. Right, 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 right. Tell yep. us about yeah. your plans for your recording session. Yeah. So I just, you know, I just, uh, released my first album back in the fall. Um, so it's interesting to now have, you know, more recording time <laughs> sort of immediately. Uh, I wasn't, you know, really like planning on, on that, but, uh, Mark's a cool guy and I'm excited to work with him. And, um, and I think I'll just, you know, probably just go in there. I've got some new songs that I've been working on, you know, always kind of working on new songs and, and, uh, you know, maybe just do some basic stuff and, you know, see where it goes and hopefully, you know, get into a bigger project that I can release in four years, you Great. know? <laughs> yeah. Everything takes time. It does, yeah. Um, what will you be playing for us tonight? Uh, I'm going to play a song called Open Arms. Great. Yeah, this is a song off uh, my album, uh, Back to the Soil, that I released uh, this past fall. Great. Yeah. Take it away. Thank you, Maureen. Maybe I just lost myself today And maybe I'm just broken pieces In a body tossed away Oh, but maybe there's still sunshine in my heart To burn off all these rain clouds And we'll watch the waters part Oh, my heart it gets tossed into the bay with open arms And someone else is playing games, but we're not Falling for the same old ways, oh, not this time No And maybe we'll never ever know Which way the wind is coming from or which way it's gonna blow oh well maybe we're just here to find the cause and time is just a tourniquet now that's blacking out the stars oh my heart it gets tossed into the bay with open arms and someone else is playing games, but we're not Falling for them same old ways, oh, not this time No Maybe I just lost myself today and Maybe I just lost myself today and Maybe I just lost myself today and 